This room will soon be filled with laughter, tears, and joy. Stories of the road and the songs that made these 29 country music pioneers country music stars. Thank you for joining us for what I think you will agree is a piece of country music history. I think Johnny Russell said it best when he described the people about to assemble in this room as representatives of the golden age of country music. So settle back in an easy chair and imagine that these legends have just paid a visit to your living room. They're here to have fun and let you go behind the scenes and share the stories of their lives just as they live them. You know, there was a time in our business when they called our music country and western. Yeah. There was a time when they called it hillbilly, too, and I remember that very well. Yeah. Yeah. Were you insulted when they called it hillbilly yeah. music? No. Sort of. No. Well, no. no. Jean says no. no. Well, I did an album called Skitter. I was in New York. A lot, of, a lot of guys want to change over to country music, a lot of these pop sounding guys. But none of them wanted to be known as a hillbilly, so if we, if, you know, I didn't that would have stopped uh, a lot of these guys from trying to sing I country music that couldn't sing. Because I didn't want to be known as a hillbilly. hillbilly <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to be known, didn't you? <laughs> I was getting to the fact that Billy Walker has recorded uh, a lot of great Western songs, yeah. songs with Western yeah. flavors yeah. to them. Well, you know, my old granddad uh, was an absolutely West Texas cowboy, uh, one of my granddads, and in fact, he rode the old Chisholm Trail. And he used to tell me a lot of stories about uh, the West, and I got fascinated uh, not only by uh, all the stories that he told, but, you know, the early cowboy singers sang about the old Chisholm Trail and all the gunfighter ballads and things like this. And uh, I guess me and Marty both were vaccinated by Sons of the Pioneers Needle, and uh, we enjoyed Gene Autry and uh, Roy Rogers and... Uh, all these songs uh, kept coming up from my youth, uh, and when I heard uh, "Cross the Brazos" at Waco, I uh, I said, "Boy, I've got to I've got to record that song." It's a great song. Would you sing it for us? I'd be delighted to. All the Chisholm Trail, it was midnight. Carmelo was strong in his mind Because of the life he had chosen Carmelo had left him behind Too long he'd been El Bandito Carmelo had left him alone But today someone brought a message She'd been seen in old San Antonio Cross the Brazos at Waco, ride hard and I'll make it by dawn. Cross the Brazos at Waco, I'd say when I meet San Antonio. He glanced back over his shoulder, the posse was nowhere in sight. He'd sent for Carmela to meet him. On the banks of the Brazos tonight She was waiting and he kept the promise he had made such a long time ago As he brought the guns that she hated In the muddy Brazos below Cross the Brazos in Waco Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn I'd say when I reach San Antonio I hear Pancho <laughs> Then the night came alive with gunfire He knew that at last he'd been found As the ranger's bed shone brightly El Bandito the ground. Carmela knew he was dying, that all of her dreams were in vain. As she kissed his lips for the last time, she heard him whisper again. Cross the Brazos and wake up, my heart and I'll make it by dawn. Cross the Brazos and wake up. 
I'm safe when I reach that top. Oh, I'm safe when I reach <laughs> San You're a great songwriter. You wrote one of the biggest hits in country music. You've written a lot of them. You wrote The Ring of Fire. You wrote more and more. But uh, Wolverton Mountain, boy, what a song. Yeah, that Thank you. Yeah. Well, I wrote this song in 1959 because I was going to see my Uncle Clifton Clowers, who lived on Wolverton Mountain. And Wolverton Mountain is in Arkansas between Clinton and Marlton, Arkansas, on the Route 65. And so uh, I thought to bring him a present. Now, he turned me on to country music. He played mandolin and fiddle. And uh, as a little kid, I said, well, I can't wait to go on Wolverton Mountain to hear Uncle Clifton pick. So when I got there, they were cutting sorghum molasses in the, in the field. And I said, uh, Uncle Clifton, I wrote your song as a present. So I sung the song to him. And uh, he was just, uh, just, just dry as he can be. He said, well, I think you wrote yourself a hit. I said, I just wrote it for you as a joke. And he said, you ought to think about that for a hit. So I, I had, uh, well, in fact, the next week I was on tour with George Jones. And uh, George and I shared a hotel room together. He said, sing me something new. I sung him a little bit of Wolverton to Mountain. He said, I hate mountain songs. <laughs> So Johnny Horton was one of my dearest friends, and of course he had the Battle of New Orleans. He was the hottest thing going, and he said, Chief, you got a song for me to record? I can make you some money now. So I song, I song it over to Mountain. He said, uh, you know something about mountain songs just don't get to me <laughs> from the plains of Texas, you know? So I gave up. I gave up on the song. I moved to Nashville, and Tillman, Franks, and Claude uh, came up to finish an album, the Comet Charles album, and uh, he said, uh, Tillman said, Merle, have you got a song? We want to help you out on your move to Nashville. Have you got a song that, uh, that uh, you know, this folk music is really big now. Have you got a mountain song? I said, do I have a mountain song? <laughs> they say don't go all over the mountain. If you're looking for a while, Boss Clips and Flowers has a pretty young daughter. He's mighty handy with a gun at night. Our tender lips, her tender lips, a sweeter line honey. <laughs> and Wolverton Mountain protects her there. Oh, the bears and the birds. Tell Clifton Clowers If a stranger Should wander there Now all my dreams All over to the mountain I want this dog For my wife I take my chance I'm gonna climb that mountain Though Clifton Flowers May take my life our tender lips, her tender lips, are sweeter than honey. And Wolverton Mountain protects her there. Oh, the bears and the birds tell Clifton Clowers if the spring should wander there. Now I'm going to climb that mountain. I'm going to get the one I love. I'm going up. I'm going up. All over to the mountain It's the lows Down here below You know it just ain't right For him to hide that daughter From the one Who loves her so I said her tender lips Her tender lips Are sweeter than honey And over to the mountain Protects her there in the bird tell Clifton Flower if a stranger should wander there 
Oh, I don't care about Clifton Flower. I can go to climb up on that mountain. I'm going to get the one I love. I don't care about Clifton Flower. I'm going to like you, Claude King. These are my people, I tell you. Love those mountain songs. I love a mountain song. One time, talking about Roger Miller, one time I was in Branson, and Roger called me, and we were talking, and he said, well, Mary and I are fixing to go eat lunch and take the kids. You want to go with us? And I said, well, I'm not ready, Roger. He said, well, if you get ready, we're going. And he told me where they were going. I didn't go because I went back to sleep. A year later, almost to the day, I'm back in Branson, and he's there. My phone rings, and I pick it up, and Roger said, you ready yet? <laughs> Well, this was after Roger had made it, and he was uh, in the Brown Derby uh, in L.A. one night, and Frank Sinatra was in there, and Roger had this girl in there with him. And uh, so he goes over to Frank's table, and he, you know, he introduces himself to him, and he says, you know, I'm Mr. Sinatra, I'm Roger. He says, yeah, Roger, I know who you are. He said, well, listen, he said, would you do me a great favor? He said, this would be the coolest thing I've ever done. He said, what's that? He said, I've got this girl in here tonight I'm really trying to impress. He said, is there any chance you would just come by the table and say, hi, Roger, like we're old buddies? He said, sure, you know, I'll do that. So Roger goes back to the table with this girl, and a little while later, Sinatra comes over to his table and says, hey, Roger, how you doing? And Roger says, not now, Frank, I'm busy. <laughs> Roger went up behind oh. Ronnie Millsap and put his hands over his ears and said, guess who? <laughs> <laughs> he was stopped by a traffic cop and the cop says, uh, can I see your license? And Roger says, can I shoot your gun? <laughs> I love what he told Johnny Cash that time. He said, don't ever put your pills and your change in the same pocket. He said, I just swallowed 35 cents. <laughs> On a cold and cloudy day When I saw the hearse come rolling Just to carry my mother away Will the circle be unbroken? Undertaker, Undertaker, please drive slow for this body. You are whole, and Lord, I hate to see her go. Will the circle be unbroken?
a lady we haven't talked about since we've all been gathered here, and I know there's a million stories about our dear friend Minnie Pearl. Nobody has, nobody's talked about. Now, Jimmy, you mentioned her a while ago that you uh, flew in the plane with uh, with uh, cousin Minnie and her husband Henry. You must have a, a jillion Minnie Pearl stories. Minnie Pearl was truly my friend because when I first came to the opera, I'd been working concerts with Mr. Acuff and with Minnie Pearl and Ernest Tubb and so many of my dear friends. Uh, I was green at the Grand Ole Opera, you know, and just starting. And I'd do little gags on stage. And Minnie Pearl, when the show was over, she said, you want me to show you how to get a better laugh out of that joke? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and take the time to show me, you know? Yeah. Teach me the timing and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it worked, you know, but what I, always, what I was always so grateful for was her taking the time to do that. Yeah. You know, the timing was was the key to what she did because she told the same stories, you know, for years Absolutely. and years. But that timing was just yeah. Yeah. so incredible. You know what she always said? If you get a good horse, ride it. That's what she said, <laughs> and that's what she did with her gags. Yeah. Same old stories year after year, but every time you heard them, they were funny. The first time I ever saw Minnie was when I was ten years old in Maryville uh, at a tent show with Roy A. Cup. And uh, I'm so thankful that in the last few years that we've had the matinee Grand Ole Opry's and on Tuesday and Thursday, uh, each time we'd be on usually around 3 o'clock or 3.30. And I'd always stay around and wait because Minnie would come out with Roy at 4.30. And Henry was standing backstage telling me what was going to go next <laughs> and telling me the stories about how many times they'd been out on the road. And he'd give me all those road stories while I'm trying to listen to what Minnie and Roy's doing. Henry was telling me the road stories. but. I'm just so thankful that I'd stayed around. You know, I, I could have been off doing other things, but I wanted to see Roy and many work together yes. as long as I could. Yeah. And I'm glad well, I saw it. <clears throat> Bill, I got a little story quick about me. There was a lady wrote to me one time and, and uh, said, it looks like you'd help me out, being that I'm your illegitimate daughter. <laughs> this is true. And I just ignored it, you know. And a few weeks later, many come up to me and says, Gene, I got a letter from your illegitimate daughter. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, I, I, I don't have an illegitimate daughter. She said, well, now that's nothing to be ashamed of. I said, if I had one, it'd be right with me. But I really don't have an illegitimate daughter. She said, but I never did, I don't think I ever convinced Minnie that I didn't have an illegitimate daughter. This, this, this girl was wanting me to send her some money, you know. I told her I was your yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not in this lifetime, see. <laughs> In 1960, <laughs> I, I will tell you, I came to the Opry and, uh, as a guest, and Minnie was on the show. And after I sang the song, I walked over to, to the side of the stage she was on, and she said, let me tell you something, Del. She said, you're going to be a big star in this business. You've got that charisma about you. And do you know, I didn't know where, what, what she was talking about. I went all the way back to California, not knowing. Was she talking good about me or what's the name? <laughs> well, I got back and asked my wife, I said, what in the world does charisma mean? <laughs> but, that's a fact. She told me that. Of course, Minnie was a school teacher. But she said that to me at South Stage in 1960. And Joe back there. Joe's, <laughs> hand Joe a microphone. He's got a well, Minnie Pearl. Yeah, when I met Minnie, Tex Ritter and I were driving from New York to California, just the two of us. Greatest trip I ever took in my life. We were going through Arkansas and there was a hat right. show print sign up on a telephone pole that said Pee Wee King's Tent Show in Pocahontas, Arkansas. I said, Tex, you know where Pocahontas says he's no, but we'll find it. And we went there and Minnie was on the show. So that's the first time I ever met her. She was a young girl and a wonderful comedian. The next time I saw her, to get close to her, she played uh, Disneyland and I went down to see her. And I had grown a beard by that time. So up on stage, she says, girls, there's that sweet Joe Allison. Look at that beard. He said, I want you girls to know that, that it's all right to go through the brush to get to a picnic. <laughs> <laughs> I worked one of the last shows that many worked. It was those Opry shows just before Juliet in Charlotte, North Carolina. She said something to me that really struck me. She was standing there. And Johnny, I think you may have been on. I'm not, I'm not sure. About, Tater, Tater was on there. And I think, I think it was while you were on the stage, Tater. She was getting ready to go on. They were getting ready to introduce her. And she looked at me and she said, do you think we'll ever get over being nervous? 
And I'm thinking, Minnie Pearl is nervous before she goes on the stage. But then she said, you know, if, if, if you don't get a little nervous, then it doesn't mean as much to you as it should. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Bill, Jan wanted to say something. Uh, I love Minnie Pearl, of course, as everyone did. But one of my most cherished moments was right after her second uh, cancer surgery. Uh, she had the surgery, I think, on on uh, Wednesday or something like that. She called me the following Sunday. She was home. And she said, what are you doing tomorrow about noon? And I said, what are we doing? And she said, well, we're having lunch, if you'll come and get me. She said, the doctor said, I can't drive, but I can eat. And <laughs> so I said, I'll be there. And I went to her home and, and picked her up. And she showed me all through her home. And I, I'd, I'd been there, but just usually downstairs in the living room, whatever. And she showed me some of her uh, treasures that she had collected through the years and out in the pool house and and it was it was really a precious time and then we went went to lunch and I had the privilege of sprint, spending three hours with Sarah Cannon right. she she was Sarah yeah. that day and that is one of the most cherished times of my life what was the difference between Minnie Pearl and Sarah Cannon uh, she was she was serious very dignified and uh, we went to the Bell Mead Country Club, which was her club, and, and she was very dignified, and, and even as many pearls she, she was. But that day, it was just a different persona. It was, it was uh, yeah, yeah, many, yeah, it was a country Class. girl. She was a, she was a classy, sophisticated lady. Because I worked the show in Charlotte, North Carolina, during her illness uh, with her, the True Values store, you remember those tours. And for 45 minutes, she went on that stage, and she never pulled one joke wow. in that 45 minutes. She was Sir Cannon. She talked about Minnie Pearl, Minnie Pearl's life in general, and kept those people <laughs> spellbound for that entire show. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> well, the, the thing about her to me was the love that she and Henry had for each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it was, a lot of it. it and she told me one time, she said the first time that she went out with Henry, their first date, they went to Roy Acuff's house, or was it a trailer, Oz? Trailer. Trailer, and they walked in the kitchen, and uh, there was two or three people down on their knees shooting dice. <laughs> <laughs> and Henry looked at me and said, this is where I want to be. <laughs> The week that Marty died, Marty Robbins died, Jimmy Riddle died that week. And uh, Minnie felt real close to Jimmy because she'd worked so much with uh, Acuff and them. And, and she was really hurting. And I was standing back by the curtain and she was going on. But she grabbed a hold of me and she said, I can't do this. She started sobbing. But she went out and she was really funny. She was extremely funny. Then she came off the stage and grabbed me and I, I kind of held her there and while she cried a little bit. And I saw Henry walk in, and he didn't come over. In a few minutes, she saw him, and so she left and went over to him. Then a few minutes later, Henry walked over to me, and he said, thanks for holding my mini. <laughs> <laughs>
Roy had come out on the stage, and as we all know, he was uh, he was pretty feeble and, uh, and and pretty sick in his last days, and it was it was really very sad the way that the, that the song came off. But then, it was so great to see that Roy Acuff never lost his sense of humor because, at the end of the song, I think the audience really sensed that something special was going on, and at the end of the song, they stood up. And I went over and put my arm around Mr. Roy, as uh, thin and frail and all as he was. And, uh, and I leaned over, of course, you know, he didn't see real well in his later years. And I said, uh, Mr. Roy, they're standing up. And he looked at me. He said, they ain't going home, are they? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got a guy over here. That, uh, Oz, how many years did you work with Roy? Fifty-four. How many? Fifty-four. Fifty-four years. Wow. Got a wow. Nice steady job. <laughs> <laughs> what do you remember about Roy Yakov? When people ask you today to, to talk about Roy, what, what stands out in your mind the most? <laughs> I'll tell you one thing that happened. It was in Pennsylvania, at Sunset Park in Pennsylvania. Oh. Robert Lund, everybody knows Robert Lund, don't you? Yeah. 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 <laughs> he was we pulled up in the park, and Roy was asleep when we pulled in the park, and Robert Lund got out and and asked everybody for a dime to see Roy Aikam sleep. <laughs> well, now, see, these guys that travel in these buses today, so they couldn't do it because y'all were in the car, right? Yeah. How much money did he make? I don't know the money. <laughs> we all got to laugh and we don't know what he made. <laughs> you got your dough, bro, over there. I think we need to hear a little bit of the great Speckled Bird. Can you oh, do yeah. that? seats and everything. He brought one of those chairs in and put it in his dressing room and he called it the Johnny Russell chair. <laughs> and uh, whenever I came in and somebody was sitting in that chair, he asked them to get up. <laughs> the only person he wouldn't ask to get up was my mother. <laughs> and I said, well, Roy, she's sitting in my seat. He said, well, you ask her. <laughs> but then we, one night I came in and he had his chair and he was facing this guy they were really in conversation. And I went over and I stood by Roy and I went, <clears throat> and the man was sitting in my chair. And Roy looked at me and he wouldn't say nothing. And I said, <clears throat> Roy, uh, and he looked at me and he still wouldn't say anything. Finally, the man said uh, something about, he felt like something was happening that he was involved in, but he didn't know what it was. And so Roy finally said, well, to tell you the truth, that's the Johnny Russell chair. And when he comes in, ever who's sitting in it, we ask him to get up so he can have a place to sit down. So he said, well, let me get up. I don't want to break tradition. <laughs> and he got up, and I sat down in the chair. And when he left, when he walked out of the room, Acuff looked at me and he said, you realize he owns every chair in here? <laughs> <laughs> it was Mr. Gaylord. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. Uh, your spots. <laughs> he, thought it, he thought it was funny. And he, uh, he got a kick out of it. Hey, I got to tell you one. When Hank Williams Jr. drew the outlaw movement at the very peak of the outlaw movement, and uh, Hank was invited to sing on the Grand Ole Opry, and Roy said, I'm going to introduce him. I've known him as a little boy. So Hank got excited, called Manuel in Hollywood, and had one of those dusters from this, uh, right from the outlaw movie. You know, boy, he was a beautiful duster, all trimmed up nice, and had a nice velvet collar and real long. And so Roy looked at him on the stage. He said, now, friends, here's uh, a little rascal that I helped raise. Tonight he's appearing with long hair and a nice little raincoat. <laughs> Hank Williams Jr. He was introducing me one night, and he he said, uh, "Here he is." And he told him where I was from, <coughs> told him about my records, and he said, "Now here he is, Johnny, uh, uh, <laughs> Johnny." Uh, uh, somebody said Russell, and he said, "Oh yeah, Johnny Russell." I came out, and he said, "Johnny said I want to apologize for not being able to remember your name." I said, "Well, that's okay, Mr. Snow. That didn't bother me." <laughs> <laughs> you know, Bill, one time, he, he and Herman Crook, you know, would uh, be on the stage a lot of time together, though, you know. And Herman walked out, and, and uh, Roy said, uh, Herman said, you, uh, did you ever drink? said, no, never did drink. He uh, <laughs> said, well, he said, uh, did you ever uh, go out with any other women? And he said, no. Roy said, you don't know what you missed. <laughs> Bill, I think probably Osgood can tell you more about this, but uh, I was along on the trip. Every time Roy would go into a restroom at a truck stop or where one of the boys would slip a note under the door and say, God is watching you. <laughs> So Acuff didn't know, of course, the boys were doing it. And they went to the truck stop, and one of them slipped a note under the door and said, God is watching you. And Roy had, had just about all he could take. So the guys had done left the restroom. He'd come out, and this big old burly truck driver sitting there, and he slapped him on the shoulder and said, I know God's watching me. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, Gee, keep, keep the microphone. Keep him, I, I was gonna, I was gonna get Gene to sing a little bit of the Wabash Cannonball. Oh, right, right. You always do that. It's... See ya. Everybody, we'll all sing. From the Great Atlantic Ocean to the wide Pacific Shore, from the Pino Flowing Mountains to the South Carolina Shore. She's mighty tall and handsome and known quite well by all. She's a combination called the Wabash Cannonball. Down from Birmingham one cold December day As she rode into the station You would hear all the people say There's a gal from Tennessee She's long and she's tall She came down from Birmingham On the Wabash Cannonball I forget what key I... All the hills are lonely Yeah, let's try to sit and see Let's see All the hills Far away Feeling on Rugged cross, the emblem of suffering, the chain, and I love that old cross where the dearest and best are away. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophy at last I lay down. 
rugged cross So despised by the world Has a wondrous attraction for me For the dear Lamb of God Left his glory to bury the dark Calvary in that church, the old rugged cross. Billy Walker. Why do you think it is when country singers get in a group together before long they're singing gospel songs? Well, I think probably it's because gospel is really the roots of country music. Uh, and two, there's, there's something spiritual uh, in country music that gospel put in there. You know, I, I was telling somebody the other day, you really... Re realize the redeeming factor of, of country music it's got a, it's really got a redeeming moral to it you take your cheating heart and uh it says if you cheat you're gonna pay and it's just like charlie shoes well i looked at this woman uh, like to be in charlie shoes i looked at this woman and i said boy would i really like to have her i really want this woman and then the desire got so strong, well, he finally got a hold of this woman, and what he got hold of was troubles, sorrows, and heartaches. And so country music and gospel music are kind of hand in hand. One is talking about the spiritual side of living, and that's the gospel. Because, see, uh, being a country music performer, and, and folks that like country music generally have a great feeling for the Lord and that's where when they sing gospel songs that feeling of being close to our Redeemer is really prevalent and then when we sing country music we sing about situations and we get lighthearted and sometimes we get sad because there are sad situations in life and that's really what country music is about but in answer to your question it's the closeness with our Redeemer when we sing gospel music. And you, you notice we all joined in and we all knew the words and we all loved what we were singing. One of the greatest gospel singers in the world is sitting behind you. I remember, no, Kitty Wells, one of the greatest singers of any kind. But I remember an old, one of the first albums that I ever had was called Singing on Sunday. You, you, you sang some just some terrific gospels. Gospel music's been a big part of your life, hasn't it, Kitty? Yes, it has. I grew up singing gospel songs. And that's where I got started, really, singing gospel songs. I bet you if we ask everybody in this room where they sang the first time in public, 90% uh, of us would say in church. Exactly. Yeah, I imagine that's I was at the zoo. At the zoo. At the zoo. Is that true? Is that true? I sung Pop Goes the Weasel at the zoo. 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 At the zoo.
I'm really happy to be a part of all this today. We're glad Great. to have you. Kitty, could you sing a gospel song for us? Yes, sir. Everybody's uh, kind of in that mood I, right now. Anybody, do you know Dust on the Bible? Yes. Oh, yeah, my key. Yeah. Yeah. What key? What key? I think that's key. Yeah. Start out with Dust on the Bible, dust on the Holy Word, the words of all the prophets and the saints of our Lord. Of all the other books you'll find, there's none salvation home. Get that dust on the Bible and redeem your soul. I went into a home one day to see some friends of mine. Of all the books and magazines, not a Bible could I find. When I asked them for the Bible, and they brought it for a shame. 